Okay, looks like it's started. Um, good evening. This is the third meeting of the Essex Design Guidelines Advisory Group. Um, before we get started tonight, I wanted to update the group on some staff changes uh, that we've had at the department. Joe Fraker, who was hosting this group and um, ran the last two meetings, has resigned. Um, but we have hired a new planner for the Essex area, and luckily we finally got her on tonight. Her name is Jessie Hillman, and uh, she's been on board for about a week now with the department. And she comes to us from um, a nonprofit, Blue Water Baltimore, where she worked for several years. So she brings a strong environmental background, which will be great for her help with the waterfront communities. We also um, have added Councilwoman Bevins and her staff to the advisory group as um, the group requested last time to extend the boundary of the area that we're looking at east all the way to Aviation Station. And that is the sixth district, sixth council district. So um, this evening, we also have with us Doris Franz Poling, who is Kathy uh, Bevins' legislative aide and either she or Kathy will um, attend the meetings and be on the group in the future. Okay, I think we can go to the next slide, Emery. Okay, so for the agenda this evening, we wanna just do a short recap of the December meeting. Uh, just, we're gonna discuss the survey results that from the online survey. We're going to take a look at the design themes that we would like to address in the guidelines and then at the end of the meeting take, I guess, a more formalized vote on um, the boundary. Okay, next slide. So at the December meeting, we took a virtual tour of the area and we looked at um, got a lot of good input on how the area could be more cohesive. And we also heard from folks that they would like to see the area expanded to uh, include Lower Back River Neck Road and again, further east into um, some of the areas where some of the shopping centers are and then down towards the new development um, at uh, Route 43 in Eastern um, Aviation Station and include Martins Airport there. So we did an online survey, um, which we got pretty good response. We had 145 persons respond. Um, most of the respondents were residents of the area. We asked eight questions. Um, seven of them were multiple choice, and then we had one open-ended question. Uh, the survey was conducted online during December, and the most important uh, or most prominent things that came out of the survey were that people wanted more landscaping, more green, and to have uh, guidelines that um, produced a better pedestrian environment. So next slide, please. So the first question we asked in the survey was, what was your relationship to the Eastern Boulevard corridor in Essex? We had 106 people who said they lived there. So by far it was the residents who responded to the survey. Uh, 28 say they visit the area for shopping and leisure. 16, they only use it to drive through to get to other destinations. And seven worked in the area. Next slide. Um, we asked how you would characterize Eastern Boulevard in Essex, the uniform response there, 140 respondents said that it was run down and four said that it was vibrant. Uh, we asked how often do you frequent the stores along Eastern Boulevard and that of course was pre-pandemic. Uh, 80 people said maybe a few times per year at most. 36 said at least once per month, and 28 said at least once per week. And then which of the following best characterizes Eastern Boulevard? We had 138 say a corridor focused primarily on moving vehicles. 
and six say a corridor that caters more towards pedestrians. Uh, the next slide is what could be done to improve the pedestrian experience along Eastern Boulevard. We had 84 people say better utilization of the sidewalk spaces by commercial tenants with things like awnings and outdoor seating. 79 respondents said that uh, they should provide more landscaping, including shade trees, benches, gardens, et cetera. Uh, seven folks said traffic calming measures like speed signs, crosswalks, medians, et cetera. And 27 said other. Um, unfortunately, not that many people that uh, checked other than went on to describe what they meant, but um, we'll try and get some clarification on that. Okay, next slide. Um, what type of parking do you prefer along Eastern Boulevard? Uh, 71 folks said they like the diagonal parking that's there. 42 uh, said they wanted head-in parking and 28 said they wanted parallel parking. And which set of architectural palettes would you like to see more of? We had 109 say war materials such as brick, stone, or wood. 31 wanted to see playful artistic um, environment with color variation, murals, and some variety. And three said industrial materials such as concrete and steel. Um, next question is where do you see Eastern Boulevard in 20 years? 68 folks said about the same as it is now. 30 said substantially different in form and use, but vibrant. 21 said about the same in form and use, but vibrant. 21 said run down and worse off. And then we have three with other. So that was a snapshot of the survey results. Do people have any questions? I wanted to remind everyone that this is, I would like to run this meeting as a discussion. So please feel free to comment and ask questions as we go along. Um, did people have any questions or comments about any of the particular survey results? Okay. Well, we will move on to the next part of the meeting. What I wanted to do here was um, discuss the issues that we would like to address uh, in the guidelines. And go to the next slide, please. So these are the things based on the input that we've heard that we would like to address within the guidelines. These are the broad categories, gateways, signage and awnings, landscaping, parking lots, area identity, which um, folks have identified the importance of the waterfront and the airport in establishing an identity, and then building facade materials. Um, those are, again, the broad categories. Does anyone have any additional category that they think we should be addressing? Laurie, if I could chime in for a second. I think one of the other things in looking at the photos that you had, I guess, a slide back and then walking, both walking the corridor and driving through both of the corridors that um, we're discussing covering as part of the guidelines. I think one of the things that should be addressed as part of the newly revised guidelines would be the issue of fencing. Um, different materials that would be sort of encouraged when it comes to fencing and different things to potentially stay away from um, going to fencing. Okay, that's a good, that's a good um, addition. I will add that in. Anyone else? Okay, let's go to the next slide then. So what I did was take each broad category and then under it list the things, the specific things that I think we will address in this category. So in gateways, um, I identified the Back River Bridge, Eastern Boulevard and Back River Neck Road intersection, the Route 43 and Eastern Boulevard intersection, Martin Airport and Aviation Station, and then the heart of Essex, which I identified here. I'm not sure if it's it's probably a larger area than this, but 
basically the intersection of Eastern Avenue and Mace Avenue, and then expanding out in either direction from there. Glory. So these are areas that we would want to denote somehow or give special treatment to, so folks know that we are kind of entering um, a special or different area along the corridor. Uh, or I think you've got covered um, coming into the area, let's say, uh, off of um, uh, Kelso and where it divides into Stemmers Run and Mace. That's sort of the divvy point. So you've got it on the one end, I guess, with Eastern Boulevard and Back River Neck Road, although you could just say Eastern Boulevard and Stemmers there because okay. that, that's basically your point. You just continue across Stemmers to Back River Neck Road. The other part, though, the heart, I think it should be Eastern Boulevard and Mace Avenue. As opposed to oh, Eastern. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, and, th and that way you're, you're now covering access to it coming in from the north because Back River Neck Bridge, Back River Bridge is obviously coming in from the uh, west. And you've got Davy Martin Airport coming in from the east. So I think you've pretty well got it covered as gateways. Okay. Yeah, and if I could just kind of tag on to uh, what John said there with Eastern Boulevard and Mace Avenue, if I'm not mistaken, and anyone in this call, please correct me if I'm wrong, that is where generally Essex Day kind of starts their whole parade of everything every year. So I think that's a really good area to focus on, not just because of the gateway, but because of the events that are really important to the community that kind of happen right at that area. It's mainly between Mace and Woodward. Mace and Woodward, okay. If I could chime in on one other gateway that I think might be important to highlight, and I know that John, when you guys had done the UDAP a couple of years ago, it was one that there was some focus given to, but it would be the Josen Hands Corner at um, Back River Neck Road and Old Eastern and Stemmers, where those three intersect. Yes, I remember that there was a great deal of focus put on that during the UDAP. It really, I know it's only the fact that it's being called a gateway. It's my only reason for not sort of jumping on that. I think it's a central point, just like I think that area of Eastern Boulevard between Woodward and Mace is a central point. I just, I, I think it's more of included in the area, sort of the heart of that district, if you will. I mean, uh, that's how I think Joe's and Hands is a very critical place that we should look at particularly since I think it still has a potential for additional development uh, with the shopping center and the old Back River Savings and Loan and the restaurant that's there on the corner. There are some real opportunities there for things to happen. So I really think it's important that it's included. I'm just not sure I would characterize it as a gateway as such because you re reach it by coming in through one of these other areas. Right. Maybe there are under these broad categories of gateway, maybe there's some sub areas that get identified um, if they are kind of within the gateway area. Well, you could call them key intersections or key points if you wanted to go that way, um, mm -hmm. because there are certain key points, if you will, like at Back River Bridge, like at, you know, Mason Eastern. There arguably are some down at the other point where Old Eastern and Eastern, uh, Eastern Boulevard and Eastern Avenue divide again. Uh, and you have that uh, gas station. But I mean, there are certain touch points there, as in Joe's and Hands is one um, that you could look at. And maybe there's one, you know, over in the Hawthorne area since we've expanded it to the other side of Middle River Bridge. Okay. Um... Anything particular in mind in Hawthorne? Um, regards to Hawthorne, I would think that Kingston and Eastern Boulevard intersection there, sort of where Gershbeck's and the old McDonald's kind of intersect there, that seems to sort of be the hub in terms of Hawthorne. That's sort of their um, entry point and the sort of corridor to get you in and out of that area. Okay. Good. Those are good, um, good additions. Anyone else have any comments? All right, we'll go to the next slide, please. Okay, so the next uh, section is signage and awnings. Heavy on the signage here. <laughs> so um, in the 
guidelines, we'll be addressing freestanding signs, building mounted signs, temporary signs, rooftop signs, um, the form of illumination that the signs have, the lettering type, um, a standard for a wayfinding sign that, you know, something that like that you have in the area that like points to the marinas and points of interest. Um, ground mounted signs, murals, uh, multiple tenant signs. We have a shopping center freestanding sign that lists all the tenants within the shopping center. And then something the task force has been wanting to do, and I think wants to use the, their facade loans for is um, to somehow come up with like a standardized address identification um, design, especially for those small buildings that are on the corridor that have been, maybe they were residences and they've been um, converted to commercial uh, buildings, but you know, it's really, people are going so fast, it's really hard to find them. And a lot of buildings just don't have an address on them at all. So that was something that the task force was very interested in seeing. Any um, comments? Um, um, just a thought, you know, the, the zoning regulations have a way in which they identify signs. And you, you've got some of them here, like freestanding, building mounted. Mm -hmm. They also have canopy. I mean, they have different kinds of building mounted signs on them. Uh, you might want to sort of look at that. The one that I don't see here that I think might be fairly problematic is changeable copy. Yes, I was just about to bring that up. I, I wanted to add that um, to our list. Yeah, because a lot of the franchises like the drug stores and the fast food and that kind of thing will have um, changeable copy signs. Gee, Lori, I thought you were going to mention the library, which, uh, <laughs> which has a rather obvious one in Towson at any rate. Right. Well, now we have the mural in Towson, so maybe it's not quite, doesn't stand out quite as much. Maybe people are looking at the mural instead. Um, anybody else have any comments about signage? We'll try and be pretty comprehensive and tie it to the zoning ordinance as much as possible, but we may um, want to encourage certain kinds of signage and discourage certain kinds of signs that are allowed within the, the zoning district. And speaking about the issue of signage, is there a way to address, um, trying to come up with the best way to describe it, but the signage that you see on glass, almost like a window cling, but it's kind of a film that covers the majority of the windows and sort of blacks out your ability to see in or out of the business? Um, is that actually signage or is it just something they're doing to their windows to not let people be able to see in? I would say sometimes it, it depends on the business. Um, in some instances, so when I had walked the, um, the boulevard uh, about a week or two ago, the business that now occupies the former location of the East County Times, um, instead of having any sort of signage out front, they have those sort of window films that cover all of their windows and show their logo and the name of the business and hours and things like that, as opposed to having any sort of changeable copy sign or freestanding sign or rooftop sign or anything like that. Okay, um, yeah, I think we will cover the um, section dealing with windows and how they, you know, need to be open to the street. So we may cover like the, the point of the film in the section of building facade materials where we're looking at the window, um, storefront windows. But um, if there's signage included within some of those, we can address that also in this section. Yeah, because we don't we don't want the last thing we want is the windows all closed up so that you really can't see anything. Um, I mean, I know there are there are some buildings that want that for security reasons, but um, we can look at look at that for sure. Lori, this is Matt. I, I would think under the way you described it's probably fine. It could also be considered maybe building mounted and under, I think under building mounted, you might have a variety of categories. You're not, you're just being general here, I, I get it. But uh -huh. um, under building mounted, you'll probably have 
uh, building identification, which might be different than say a storefront or a tenant identification. And then on the storefronts themselves, you, in the buildings as well, whether they're you know flush mounted or projecting or you know, there probably could be a variety of different types, and that might be a way to address anything applied to the actual storefront itself as well. Okay. Alrighty. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> so the next area that we will be addressing is landscaping. And um, we saw a lot of response about landscaping um, in the survey. I think most of it was geared kind of towards the public sidewalks um, as opposed to private property, but we'll be looking at both in this. Um, so we'll have a section on street trees that will identify the appropriate species of street trees and good locations for them along the corridor. Um, planter boxes, I think we would probably want to take our lead from what the task force has already done in terms of the planter boxes that they've um, established out um, with close to the banners and kind of their focal area along the boulevard. Um, we may, as we move into other sections that don't have planters and where the street is um, more lanes and the buildings are set back further from the street, we may come up with a different design that's a different scale and has a different location um than those that are in kind of the traditional main street area but we will be looking at those property screening is basically landscaping that and and or fencing that um would screen properties from one another um and sometimes uh from the uh, street front and then parking lot screening particularly from the street front we want to see um, a landscape buffer or some way to screen large parking lots and then landscape within the parking lots themselves um, as they get redone. I think that um, people could look at the, the old Salvo shopping center and the name of it is escaping me right now on Back River Neck Road to see they've recently redone their parking lot and I think they did put in some pedestrian connections and screening and some and some trees, tree islands. Um so, is the name you're looking for. You got the name? Country Ridge Shopping Center. Country Ridge, right, right. Yeah, that's a good example of, you know, a, a parking lot that was in terrible condition and has recently been redone um, and can probably have some more done to it, but um, they put quite a bit of work into it so far. Um, and then finally, green roofs for any new construction that might take place. Um, we're just looking for um, the new construction to be sustainable. So to the extent that um, properties can do something with greening of their building, <clears throat> we'd like to see that. Any questions, comments on this section? Any things we need to add? All right, next slide. Okay, so the next one deals with parking lots, which as we expand the boundary, there'll be quite a few of them that will be within the boundary because there's quite a few uh, large shopping centers. So we want to look at the surface material, the tree and planting islands, the crosswalk and pedestrian connections from the parking lot into the buildings, um, screening in the form of landscaping and or fencing. Um, and that can be from the street edge, but also from adjacent properties. Um, the layout and location of the parking in relationship to the building. Now we were always trying to get buildings closer up to the street as um, things uh, go under redevelopment and with the parking behind and we usually don't win that battle, but um, something to think about. And then ingress and egress where you have a corridor with a lot of points of ingress and egress as places come in to redevelop 
if we could get some shared points of ingress and egress, that would be helpful. Anybody have any suggestions for this section? I have more of a question for this section. Is okay. this something that uh, is looking to establish further parking lots in the area or for the existing parking lots in the area to be redone? Uh, it's for the existing parking lots and then for any that would, you know, if a new uh, franchise location came in that like a new drugstore or something, we developed a site that had a parking lot, we would expect them to comply with the standards that we come up with for parking lots. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So, hold on one quick thing. On the issue of parking lots, is there an ability to, uh, I don't want to force it on anyone, but just sort of um, encourage maybe electric car charging spots and things like that, if that's sort of the way that we're going moving forward? Sure, we can include that. <clears throat> um, we also probably will include something that requires um, installation of bike racks at the larger shopping centers in the parking area. Alrighty. Do you think you need to address uh, lighting as part of this, or is that covered somewhere else? Uh, we have covered lighting in another area that really speaks to the lighting along the corridor, but I think we do need to add lighting to this parking lot section. That's good. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> I'm thinking you're probably going to want your parking lots to be lit differently, maybe with a different pole, different height of pole or whatever, than maybe something that's more pedestrian oriented, you know, your streetscape, et cetera. So. Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, any other questions, comments on parking lots? Okay, we can move on to area identity. So these are, in this section, we wanna identify the features that will give the area a more cohesive identity. And we want to look at gateway signage and sculpture. And I think primarily that means the cube or something else, but there are other areas that could possibly have something that signifies um, you know, that you're coming into the area in the form of signage and sculpture. So we wanna look at it for all the kind of key intersections or um, gateways at either end that we identified. Um, the murals, um, the task force has contracted with a mural artist to kind of put together a mural program and um, we want that to, of course, coincide with what the group would like to see in terms of murals in the area. Um, and that could include a theme like what mur uh, the murals should um, take up as far as the theme for the area, uh, any specific color palette or any spe specific location that people think um, would be good for murals. Um, and then um, native waterfront plantings um, in areas where the gardens um, and the medians are uh, being planted. If we could, you know, kind of pull in the identity of the waterfront through the plantings, um, <clears throat> people expressed an interest in doing that. Historical markers could be just any kind of plaque or marker. It doesn't have to be of an official historic site, but of you know areas of interest of history throughout the throughout the corridor um, that might add some visual interest to the corridor. Um, Laura, on, yes. on the historical markers part, I just wanted to kind of chime in there. Um, I really love that idea, and that's been something that I guess. 
committee here that we've all kind of highlighted on is that the Essex and Middle River area both have a very rich history and that's definitely one of the area's strengths and one of the things that I think that we should work to sort of play off of and build off of. Um, one of the things that as the community I've seen in different developments and one of the things I point to is the TD Bank that's up at the Waterview Shopping Center. When they did their interior design and they have a huge mural of an old um, photo of Joseph Hand's Corner. That's really neat and helps kind of pay um, homage to the area's history. I think if there's a way to uh, sort of build on that historical marker thing, if it's not necessarily a marker, because maybe that specific location is not of any historic significance, but maybe if there's a way to just kind of incorporate or pay homage to the area's history, that, that would also be a neat thing to incorporate as you're putting designs together and, and things like that. Thanks. I think that's a good idea. Um, if you know, folks want to give me, um, you know, email me ideas they have for what historical either sites or images or events they think should be identified. Um, that would be great. Um, again, it doesn't have to be official historical. In other words, I, it doesn't have to be like designated by the lands, um, Landmarks Pr Preservation Group or anything. It can just be, you know, cultural history <clears throat> that took place in the area. Okay, and then um, a paving pattern. You may want to come up with a paving pattern um, of a combination of you know paving materials that's unique to the Essex area um, and we have like in Towson we have a Towson paving pattern that looks at a certain dimension of concrete and then it's banded with a certain dimension of brick and a location where the tree pits are located um, we may want to come up with something specific for Essex so that there's a consistency of that and finally, um, special street lighting. There is some special lighting uh, in the section of the corridor that's um, had the attention paid to it in terms of the um, planters and the banners. Um, the group worked very hard to get the lights repaired and painted. Um, so I think a lot they're a lot more present these days than they were when they were not working. Um, but we may want to look at um, lighting for the specific areas along the corridor. Any questions, comments? <clears throat> Next slide, please. Okay, and then building facade materials, we want to make sure that we're getting quality quality, durable materials that are really meant for, you know, the exterior of buildings that are going to stand the test of time. We want them to reinforce the architectural styles that are there. Um, and that doesn't mean necessarily duplicating them, but it does mean tying in with them in a way that tying in with the context of what's there. Um, Replacement materials looking to, to provide some guidelines for people as they are replacing either windows or doors or some other element of their existing building. I look at how materials can um, aid in the pedestrian experience at the ground floor. In other words, there may be, we may want to use different materials in the ground floor that would be more inviting to a pedestrian at more interest. Um, openings and articulation, basically windows um, and doors, uh, corner locations, how they could be treated specially to um, denote um, a special part of the corridor or how they could be treated perhaps with a mural because of their high visibility. Uh, architectural finishes, just the, um, you know, the type of siding and brick and stone and other finishes that could be used. And then the color palette. Um, the survey indicated that 
at least of the respondents that replied to the survey that the color palette that was wanted was kind of a natural one of using, you know, warm tone brick and stone um, for the colors. So um, if folks have any other ideas about a different type of color palette, we'll certainly look at that too. Uh, maybe my memory may be playing tricks, but I thought that the UDAT used uh, examples of what they considered to be uh, rebuilding, uh, like the uh, bank uh, in Essex, they thought was a really good example of how they, they vigilant tied in concepts that were up and down the boulevard in its construction. And then I think they picked out the CVS or the pharmacy there for something that really didn't look like it was part of that. And one of the things we might want to consider, because in giving guidance to people who are coming in, I mean, the first people coming in to renovate are going to need some guidance as to what is going to be appropriate. And they're going to mm -hmm. set the tone. I mean, it's not the last guy in. He's got a whole, you know, he sort of knows what's been approved in the past. But I think the first groups coming in to redevelop are going to need some guidance. And if there's a kind of development or kind of look that we're after as to what is an architectural style, because I think most of us would agree, you can find darn near anything uh, right. in this in this group. I, I think we ought to make suggestions as to what really seems to have worked, if you will, uh, as, as far, and we don't have to point to ones that don't, but what really does work to give them an idea as to uh, what kind of architecture style are we looking at? What kind of uh, finishes are we looking at? That sort of thing. And I was thinking you might want to look at the UDAC for some of that discussion. Okay. Yeah. I mean, as we put these together, and that's, I think, the, my last slide of kind of our next steps when we get to that, we'll delve into this a little bit more. But as we put these together in even a draft, we're going to have a lot of material that's um, visual to go along with it to say, you know, where we say, um, reinforce architectural style, we'll have visuals that show how that's been done in the area or how, you know, and in, in some cases where it hasn't been done correctly to help people visualize that. So um, if there are particular buildings that you think that are along the corridor that we should be using as um, what people could look to to achieve, <laughs> um you know a, a good building facade let me know which ones they are and we can uh, make sure we include those in the visuals laurie although it's not necessarily on the corridor um i would say pizza gentlemen's would probably be another good one along back over neck road is sort of the gold standard of, of what we would be looking for and how to do design incorporate landscaping incorporate sort of your parking lot here to the back of the building enhance your pedestrian experience um, I think that that one, along with what John had said with the village at, um, up in the heart of Essex, those two are definitely gold standards when it comes to commercial redevelopment. Okay. Uh, Laura, this is Matt. I think I mentioned this maybe one or two meetings ago. In addition to materials, I think this is what John was getting at. There was just the composition of the facade as well. And I'm, if you look at some of the buildings that John mentioned that are are well liked there's probably a certain proportion of windows they're probably you know whether they're more vertical or whatever or square upper story windows align with lower story windows a certain sy symmetry to the facade there's a mm -hmm. proportion of glazing to say solid you know brick or stone or something um i don't think you have to get overly detailed but look at some of those things regarding uh photographs and see if you want to build some of that into the um into the guidelines so that someone is isn't just looking at it in terms of materials and color and color palette, but they're also looking at the, uh, when you're trying to describe for them, the sort of composition of the facade as well. The other thing okay. we have to consider is, I mean, let's suppose for argument's sake, that someone came in in the 500 block of, of Eastern and wanted to redevelop the entire, you know, Southeastern side of that block with the parking and go up seven stories to do senior housing, just to take a, a pop at it and do something like that. To, because I think part of the redevelopment of Essex is gonna involve bringing in people to actually use the retail. 
And mm -hmm. so let's suppose somebody wanted to come in and do a seven story building. What would it look like? What, because we can't vision that in a way because everything there is one or two stories. So what would a larger size building, how would we want it to look? Because that's the kind of redevelopment that we're talking about. I don't think we're talking about, I don't see the impetus for anyone to tear down, let's say what's there, just to rebuild what's there. They would want to basically, you know, if they tore it all down, they'd want to do something and go up. Uh, we see that in Towson. So that, you know, imagining how that would look and the kind of facade and the kind of proportions that that kind of a building would have, I think is a much tougher sort of task than simply saying, well, we've got a concrete facade, let's replace it with brick, or we've got, you know, or we want the windows on this floor to be slightly smaller. That to me is, the, is gonna be the tougher kind of issue, I think when, if people come in to redevelop or they take down Country Ridge and they wanna go up with apartments. You know, what is it that that would look like? Just hypothetically saying, you know, those are the kind of things that UDAT tried to do to tro totally reimagine what these corridors would look like. And I think that's part of what we have to sort of recognize if we wanna come in with this new design guidelines. Okay, so basically maybe a section on form and building form and scale. Is that... I, I don't know if it's so much building form and scale, but I, I think that John makes a valid point that when we're putting together these guidelines, the guidelines should not only be geared towards sort of the small Main Street redevelopment, but also take into consideration that what if, what if someone wants to come in along this area and build, you know, a high rise senior housing complex? What if someone wants to come in and do, um, uh, something like you would see the um, town center in Annapolis where you have apartments above and shopping below. Um, and I think they're trying to uh, do the guidelines open-ended enough so that you can still apply them to both scenarios is, is sort of the, the goal that I think we should look towards. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, thanks. Um, let's see, next slide. So the next steps um, are that we are going, based on your input, we, our staff at the planning department is going to begin a first draft of the guidelines um, over the next month. And kind of simultaneously with that, we will be working to create um, some kind of before and after renderings of key buildings applying the guidelines. So um, if folks have any um, key sites within the uh, CRD boundary that they'd like us to look at for these before and after renderings, um, let me know what they are. And then um, we will bring those back to the group in March. I don't have an exact date yet, but um, so we could begin at that point to share the first draft and get input. Um, and then the last thing, which I don't have on here is I did want to get kind of a final vote, if you will, um, on expanding the boundary. Um, I think the group was pretty, um, Pretty much everyone was in favor of it. I might have heard one or two folks say that that kind of um, took away from the effort in the core. Um, but could I just get by, um, you know, saying yay? <laughs> um, or anybody, put it this way if there's anyone who's opposed to expanding the boundary, could you um, uh, adjust the group and let them know your reasons for your opposition? Well, Lori. May I ask a question? You know, before I voted on this, I, I've always looked to the planning department as sort of the experts when it comes to planning and mm -hmm. looking at areas. And and you know, I may not act that way when I'm in a hearing against you, but why well, I look at you as as the experts in this? You've had the training in it. What are your feelings? You know, the planning department and you all in expanding this area. Do you see any downside to it? Do you feel that we can cohesively come up with design guidelines for this large area? I mean, because I just sort of like your input 
uh, and that of Amy, if she's still on, to, to sort of how you view this and, and whether you feel that this is a, a good change. Amy, you want to speak to that at all? I'm here. I'm just I'm on another meeting. Sorry. No, sorry. No, I mean, I think, you know, we just, you know, I think as far as the guidelines go, um, you know, um, expanding the, the boundary definitely, you know, makes things a little bit more, um, I guess, complicated or elaborate if you're looking at the guidelines themselves because they have to cover a bigger area and, you know, and the um, buildings are so diverse and, and they're different and, you know, that water takes down versus, um, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so, you know, I guess that's the question or do you turn it into, um, you know, more like nodes? You can approach it, you know, if you do, if you are looking at a larger area, you can look at nodes maybe instead, you know, I think that it's, you know, it's just, you know, just thinking about how you want to approach it. I don't think it's not, I think it's doable, you know, to have a big area. I just think you have to be careful that, you know, the things that you really want aren't kind of washed out because it was just too big to try to, to squeeze into one document. Um, that could, I think that's something on our end um, that we can help walk you through. And I think it does make sense that um, by expanding the area, we will have design standards for the entire commercial revitalization district. So if someone comes in to use any of our programs or you know access any of our loan monies, there there are designs, you know, there will be design guidelines to which they have to comply. So it, it makes it a more comprehensive approach, but definitely it will take us longer and it will be more complicated um, to, you know, produce the final guidelines. But. With, with the input that Amy had with respect to doing it in different nodes, that makes a lot of sense to me because that then goes back to the UDAT where yes, they tried to have an overall pull it together, but they did consider them as separate areas because I think there are just, differences obviously in the development pattern let's say of the middle river area than certainly downtown essex and you know back river neck road is a different issue as well than downtown essex or middle river so with the idea that we look at nodes and maybe try and come up with a unifying concept uh i would vote in favor of the expanded area okay anyone else you know, this is Sandy. John uh, just mentioned Middle River. I thought we were dealing with Essex. Are we really going in the Middle River? Well, we're, we'll be going to the <laughs> to the extent of the commercial revitalization district. So as far east as that expand uh, extends, which I think is not in the river, Sandy, but on the banks anyway. <laughs> And Lori, this is Martha. I just would like to add that Middle River is already in the residential review area, partially, not the whole Middle River area, but it is, it is already uh, design review and tunnel area. Yeah, I mean, this, this section of Eastern Boulevard is not really even close to the existing Middle River DRP area. So um, I don't think we call it Middle River. I think we call it the Eastern um boulevard uh advisory uh guidelines or the essex um advisory guidelines i i you know we'll come up with a better name obviously but um it doesn't it doesn't um conflict with any existing uh design review area or commercial revitalization area by including all of it it only makes everything conform to one another like all the processes and the resources will be applied to the same area. <clears throat> I just wanted to chime in and say that I had, I guess I would agree with what John had said that there, I would be highly supportive of sort of a, expanding the boundaries of the review area and then having some sort of overarching theme, but then being able to focus in on um, specific nodes for different areas um, downtown Essex area, those 
sort of outlier areas, back river neck road corridor, um, so that each one of those areas can get the attention that they deserve, but there can still be that sort of unifying um, factor that's able to tie everything together to deliver a cohesive, um, aesthetically pleasing project. Okay, thank you. Well, it seems that there's consensus that we expand the boundary and approach it from <clears throat> breaking it down into um, workable areas that have some identity. So um, whether we call it nodes or points of interest or whatever, but um, I think that that answers our question about the boundary. All righty, well, uh, it is 7.05 um, and that's all I have for this evening. If people have questions uh, about the next steps for the meeting, I will be sending out, um, as we get closer to the next meeting, I'll be sending out uh, you know, a meeting invitation. Um, we'll try and make it on a Tuesday at six again. Um, uh, it will not be until March um, because we'll have a quite a big job in front of us to get the first draft going. But um, <clears throat> if you want to uh, send any comments or questions during that period of time, um, send them to me, Lori Hay at lhay at baltimorecountymd.gov or to Jesse Hellman. That's Jay Hellman at baltimorecountymd.gov. Um, and we'll be glad to take into consideration whatever you forward on to us. Any other comments, questions? <clears throat> Thank you, Lori. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Lori. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, John. Thank you. Good night. 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 Thanks, everyone. Everyone. All right, thanks. All right, thanks.